Hi, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, to the October analyst debates um, session with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague Colin Szynski in Canada. Once again, as of last month, we are going to be previewing this evening's FOMC, Federal Reserve rate announcement and looking at what to expect um, with respect to tonight's meeting. But before I get started, I have to, I have to display the obligatory uh, risk warning um, before we get started for all the regions, not only UK, but also um, Ireland and Canada as well. And uh, once, once we've got that out of the way, we can we can now get started. So, um, slightly different. I think we've got a slightly different expectation today than we did six weeks ago, haven't we, Colin? Because I think there was a there was a little bit of uncertainty as to whether or not um, the Fed would actually keep rates unchanged. I think there was an expectation that Fed the Fed might increase interest rates. There's no such expectation today. Um, and I think most people are focusing on the December meeting now as opposed to this meeting. And I think most of the attention is going to be focused on what the Fed says in its statement rather than on what it does. And I think that's being reflected to a certain extent in some of the price action that we're seeing this afternoon and over the last day or so in the wake of last week's sharp rise in equity markets that we saw on the back of the easing by the People's Bank of China and the potential for further easing from the European Central Bank, though we are now getting some ECB policymakers reining back expectations about a move in December um, after Mr. Draghi's comments in Malta last week. And I think that does make, I think that certainly makes the currencies that much more interesting. But I also think it makes it that much more difficult for the Federal Reserve to raise rates at a time when um, the two other biggest central banks in the world are moving in the opposite direction. What we'll also be doing today, as well as previewing the FOMC, is we'll have a look at obviously what the Swedish National Bank did this morning in easing policy further, even though it didn't cut rates, it did expand its QE program, and Colin will go into some detail about that. We'll also be looking ahead to the RBNZ uh, rate announcement later tonight and the Bank of Japan's announcement later this week. But for here and now, let's look at the market reaction in the wake of what happened at the end of last week. And in this context, I think it's probably a good idea to start with equity markets, Colin. Do you think? Sure. Let's start with the indices, and uh, oh. let's look at uh, at the, at the uh, reactions to a few of these things over the last uh, the last couple of weeks. So, if you want to bring us, say, let's maybe start with the S and P, and because we're getting a mix here, and, and I think what we want to be looking at is that the reaction to the news that we get, it, uh, in addition to the news itself, is it, quite significant. And, and the reason for that is going back to the last Fed meeting, a lot of people had expected the Fed would either raise rates or they would signal that they were about to raise rates, or what we'll call the hawkish hold. The, um, that they would raise rates sometime this year. What we ended up with was a dovish hold, mostly because in the dot plot, we had one member who is most likely Kosher Lakota who said, that, no, I think rates should go down and should go negative. And that kind of threw the, a big monkey wrench into the whole thing. And the Fed's been trying to backpedal for the last six weeks. And, and it's, it's, it's a kind of all ended up clear as mud. So what we're really seeing with the Fed is today, this is their chance to, to do a do-over and, and get a rate this time and, and make things a little bit more clear. Are they, are they still leaning towards raising rates in December? or are they Looking at, at holding off till next year. Today, there's 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 absolutely no way the Fed's going to raise interest rates. The reason for that is that we've got a budget crisis going on in the U.S. They hit their debt ceiling next week, which means the U.S. government's about to run out of money. There's no way the Fed's going to run uh, raise interest rates when the U.S. government's about to run out of money. Now, it looks as though they've got a deal to to deal with that and, and push off, push that crisis off till after the election and into 2017. But it hasn't passed yet, so the uh, the Fed's kind of stuck. There's no way they can do anything today except signal what they might do in December. What we've got to watch for in December is the uh, the, the 
deadline from the last budget stopgap measure is December 11th, which is just a few days before the December Fed meeting, and uh, and that could be the time where they're heading for another budget showdown, possibility of a government shutdown over the holiday season. So. Again, it's still uh, even that is uh, is iffy on factors that go outside of the the economy and are more uh, more politically driven. So so. Going back to all of this, when we had the dovish hold come out of the Fed, the stock market went down. Historically, when we've gotten any kind of dovish comments out of central banks, stock markets have gone up and the, uh, whatever currency it was has gone down. And this time the stock markets went down. And the reason was because the street saw it as a negative signal. They went, well, hold on a minute. If you were getting ready to raise rates and now you're not, what's wrong? What does that mean for corporate earnings, resource demand, the economy, and so on? And, and so without... So that was the, the reaction to the last Fed meeting when they went dovish. Last week, the ECB went dovish and stock markets took off. People were still seeing that as a good thing for Europe. Then we got the PBOC rate, height, rate cuts, which were seen as positive in Europe and North America. But by the time the weekend rolled through, Chinese markets actually went down. So, uh, so people weren't as enthusiastic about it in Asia Pacific. So. To make a long story short, we're, uh, it, it's the, uh, we, we, we probably will get a fairly significant reaction to the news, but it may not necessarily be the one people have, would think we've been getting based on how the markets have reacted the last four years. There's a change going on. And I think that's borne out. I think the reaction in equity markets, certainly in the context of the declines that we've seen and subsequent bounce back in the S&P 500, is notable for the fact that the S&P 500 and the Dow have both recovered above their long-term 200-day moving averages. And that's borne out by this chart here. Mm -hmm. That was the, This was the August lows. And I think it's also quite interesting that these August lows also coincide with the lows in crude oil at exactly the same point in time. And we'll look at that later, because since those lows in August and the, and the crude oil lows, equity markets predominantly have traded in lockstep with crude oil until, um, w until we got this move higher on Thursday, where we got a strong move higher in the S&P, the DAX, and the, and the FTSE 100, we didn't get a strong move higher in oil. Now, maybe that's a delayed reaction. We've certainly seen a significant sell-off in oil. Yeah, we're getting a bounce back today. And now, is that on the back of a weaker dollar? Is that in expectation of a, a dovish Fed going into the December meeting? The biggest question, I think, is will the Fed deliver or will the, will, will the Fed keep a December rate rise on the table, given what we've seen thus far? And I think that really is the big question, and I think the statement is going to be key in that regard, notwithstanding the fact we've now got some very clear divisions between policymakers on the FOMC. How will the statement handle those divisions? And I think in that context, this meeting could be very, or this statement could be very important in determining whether or not the Fed hikes or holds in December. My preference is still for a hold into the end of the year with a hike potentially in the first or second part of 2016. Collins, I don't think, is quite ready to hang up his hike boots quite yet, but I think the, 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 the odds of it happening um, are diminishing pretty much by the day, and that's borne out by this particular chart or this particular um, chart that I'm looking at here with respect to the Fed funds. The Fed funds rate assign a 4% probability of a move in the Fed funds rate today. In December, they only assign a 34.7% probability of a hike. Um, that, that's up from yesterday where it's 328 But basically what it's saying is that the market's not expecting a hike today. And if the Fed does hike today, then I think they'll blow any credibility that they have left with respect to how they've guided the market. And it certainly, I think, would blow their forward guidance uh, credentials right out of the window because they certainly haven't guided the market to expect a rate rise today. But what's interesting here, and I think this is borne out by the fact that we've seen a strong rebound in U.S. markets on an expectation of a much more dovish Fed going forward into 2016, you contrast that with what we've seen in the DAX, yes, we've seen a similar sort of rally, but look at the rally, look at the contrast 
this was the move that we saw on Thursday, Friday, and this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, today. So over the course of the last two days, that was the ECB, that was the People's Bank of China, and look where we've rebounded off. We've rebounded off the 50% retracement of the entire down move from the all-time highs to the lows that we saw at the end of September and the lows that we saw here as well. These are the August lows, which also coincide with the S&P lows. It's a similar sort of story with respect to the UK 100. Again, a similar sort of rebound, slightly different shape and format. Also, it's slightly less aggressive in terms of the move simply because of the heavy weighting that commodity stocks have in this particular index. But this 6450 level on the UK 100 is a big, big level on a Fibonacci retracement level. So we can see that not only is the S&P above the 200-day moving average, as is the Dow, but also the DAX and the UK 100 are at the 50% retracement levels from the lows that we saw earlier this year. And it's quite notable the fact that even though the DAX managed to match the lows that we saw in August in September, the FTSE 100 didn't. Now let's look at crude oil prices and look for the correlations there because this afternoon's move in crude has been quite interesting. And this is something that I think, Colin, you'd probably like to expand on quite nicely because I think if we look at this WTI chart here, we did break out yesterday, but we weren't able to follow through below that 4290 level that I yes. talked about in my video on Tuesday. And look at that. So you had a false break. You've got no result on the stochastics, and now you're getting the, the big, big positive reversal. You've got a – we're now up to a 6% gain on uh, on WTI, 5% gain on uh, on Brent. So we're – and on, on our platform, it's 5.4% and 4.4%. So big, big, big uh, update for a crude oil here. Part of which I think is, is, is a catch-up rally. We're seeing that we did get a uh, – the, the inventory decline in the U.S. wasn't all that big, but it didn't go up as, it didn't go up huge again. But we also had an uptick in implied demand, and that's what I've been keeping an eye on because the, uh, the, the recent weakness in the crude oil price had been following implied demand down. Now that it's ticking up, we're starting to see crude oil go up. And and that's something that's really important I think we got to watch for with crude in, in particular is that it's been trading off of demand. I mean, people, you know, sometimes crude trades off supply and people get worried about you know, supply disruptions in the Middle East and things like that. The story in crude oil trading is demand driven right now is the, the, uh, the supplies people have seen are starting to come down in the U.S. And, and what have you, but it's really about demand. What did we see last week with the, uh, with the ECB and the PBOC when they, when they went dovish, crude oil went down because people went again oh my gosh, their economies must be weak, that's really bad for crude oil demand and then wind oil. Today I think we're getting quite a, uh, um, certainly some encouragement on demand out of the U.S. and a, a bit of a catch-up pop. I think things have gotten, it have gone down straight down for several straight days here and uh, I think we're getting a, a relief rally. But, uh, but overall when we look at crude, it looks like it's bottoming out and, uh, and it started to consolidate at a, at a higher level. We got to the channel bottom, was about 43, 42.90 as Michael said, and we're having a nice bounce off that. That is actually a good sign of support. We're also getting some support in the equity markets. and, and some Something that I, I was watching as, as Michael was cycling through the, the last group of charts is that the other thing to note is that we are getting a nice seasonal upturn here uh, in stocks where we're coming out of the weakest time of the year for stocks and, and we've seen double bottoms now. We've had a double bottom between the end of August or the middle of August and the end of September, early October depending on the market. Nice double bottom bases being put into place. We're starting to climb out of those and if we go to the, uh, the Hang Seng, I believe it's actually a triple bottom. So the other thing we are seeing is that some of the fears that had driven the markets way down in August have started to uh, to subside a little bit uh, as well, some of the bearishness. And there we've got basically what looks like a, a triple bottom in the Hang Seng, double bottom for the uh, uh, markets in other regions. Well, actually, I mean, I can just basically draw a nice line through that. We've broken out of yeah. that, so it looks as if we're probably going to head up towards the 200-day moving average on that yeah. particular chart. It's very easy to project a double bottom breakout here. The, 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 the base hasn't exactly matched, but again, we've got the lows on the 24th of August. We've got the break higher. You just basically project the distance between these two points here 
up from the breakout point, which should give you a target roughly, I think, of probably round about where the 200-day moving average is right now. Now, what I would be concerned about here is this is potentially a, be a bearish candle, and mm -hmm. I am a little bit concerned about that in the short term. So we could, in the short term, drift back towards this trend line support here. It was resistance. It's now support. Support and resistance um, lines do have a tendency to reverse their functions once they break out. I think we've certainly seen that borne out in this particular context here. We broke higher, we've come back, we've retested the previous highs, and then we've gone higher again. So we are in a bit of an uptrend here, but this negative candle here does give me a little bit of a pause for thought in, in the context of what you were talking about earlier with respect to the weak reaction of Chinese markets to the announcement of fresh stimulus. And I think that's why we saw that's a red candle there. That red candle there, which 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 occurred on the Monday. So, so for me, I think we we are at risk of a little bit of a pullback there. I I wouldn't expect the pullback to exceed um, this particular line here, but if it does, then then the prospect of a move back to the lows is very much on the cards. But certainly, in, from from what we've seen thus far, 22,300 is going to be a key support level if if in fact we do drift back to that level. So. So, so that's the Hang Seng. We've talked about that. Um, can we do we, gold, Michael? We can do gold. I was just about to move on to that. One other thing okay. that has prompted a little bit of a move higher is, is gold. Now, maybe there's an expectation here that we are going to get a dovish Fed. certainly does beg the question. We did break the 200-day moving average very, very briefly in the, middle, in the middle of October. We are now coming to the end of October. We are potentially going to be posting a very bullish month, not only for gold, but also for equity prices. And I think that also bodes well for a move higher in gold prices. Prices. And if that happens, that then doesn't tie in with a hawkish Fed, because we all know that tighter U.S. monetary policy generally doesn't have a particularly um, positive effect on the gold price. And um, that's certainly worth something that we do need to bear in mind when we start thinking about where gold goes to next, where I think by and large, on a seasonal basis, gold prices tend to do fairly well in the fourth quarter. Uh, yes, we're definitely moving into a seasonally favorable period for gold. Gold usually bottoms out for the year mid to late summer, and then it usually peaks for the year sometime between January and uh, and April. And I, th I think it's important here to note that with the Fed, it's not in, in gold and the U.S. dollar is it's not just about whether they when they when they raise rates, but also the path of afterwards. If we go back to the beginning of this year, the market was not just expecting that the Fed would start raising interest rates in say March. They were expecting that the, that this would be the beginning of a series of interest rate increases, like we saw the last time where the Fed, uh, so when they started raising rates, they raised rates every meeting for like 12 meetings, and uh, and they just kept on going. And, and as the year has progressed, not only have they delayed the launch, but the number of potential rate hikes has decreased as well, and, uh, and to, to the point where now it's, it's probably whenever they do do it, they're probably going to do one and then bend over backwards and say, okay, that's going to be it for a while. So they're going to be, when they do launch, they'll probably be one and done, maybe two and done max. We're not looking at a series of, of rate hikes taking them back up to, to 2%. We're looking at maybe getting a year from now, maybe if we're, maybe they'll get to 1%. We'll see, right? And, and so because of that, the U.S. dollar, though, even by March, had priced in a – and immediately, like by March, that, that they would start raising rates in March and that they would go on a campaign of, of several rate hikes. And, and so really, the U.S. dollar has gotten quite ahead of itself relative to, uh, relative to other currencies based on, and relative to what the Fed is actually has done and, and, is, and is likely going to do. So because of that, we're seeing that even if they did signal that they're going to raise rates once, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the end of the line for this gold recovery because – the U.S. dollar is still likely overvalued and likely to come down, and and, and the, uh, the which enable, is enabling the price of gold to uh, to rebound as well. Uh, you know, and I think that's that's another thing. I think we've already seen um, a significant tightening effect from mm -hmm. the, the value of the dollar over the course of the last few uh, since the beginning Absolutely. of the year. The, the, the dollar's gone up quite significantly, and I think that more than anything, rather than anything the Fed's done, has tightened monetary conditions in the U.S. And I think that that can be that can be borne out by yeah. some of some of the economic data that we've seen over the course of the past few months. And I think yeah. if you actually look at um, the, the 
some, some spread, I've done some spreadsheets here. Durable goods orders. We hear an awful lot about how well the U.S. economy is doing. Yet yeah, thus far, durable goods, core durable goods, that's stripping out aircraft and all large items like that, declined 2.2 percent. And this week's numbers, as well as the lower revision to the August numbers, point to a U.S. consumer that doesn't really have the appetite to make large-scale purchases even. And Whirlpool's profit warning, I think, highlights that, 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 very, that very narrative. Whirlpool, one of the biggest white good producers in the U.S., issued a profits warning last week. So, you know, new home sales fell quite sharply. Um, Non-farm payrolls are now starting to trend down, and we, and, you know, we, we, we Walmart cut their forecasts. Uh, Walmart cut their forecasts. Look at look at the payrolls numbers for the last two months. Yeah. Here we've got 142 for September. We've got 136 for August. That's a sharp fall from the numbers that we were seeing in the middle of the summer. 223, yeah. 245, 260. And you had a theory on that, didn't you, Colin? The, the sharp fall in the payrolls numbers was yeah. predicated on an expectation the Fed would raise rates, and they didn't. That's right, because I went back and looked at 2004 when the uh, the Fed started raising rates, and those were the kind of numbers they were running, 250s to 350s, and then when they actually raised rates in in 2004, jobless claim, uh, sorry, uh, payrolls plunged to like 50,000 and stayed there for two or three months, and then started tracking back upward again. And the uh, with, with that, those payrolls numbers looked to me like Main Street was fully expecting the Fed to raise interest rates in September, reacted accordingly, and then of course now the, now it's all uh, it's all out the window because the Fed didn't raise rates. So now what do we do? And and that's another thing. G generally speaking, I think that even though we're not seeing it in Fed funds and Wall Street hasn't priced in a uh, a Fed rate hike, I think Main Street certainly has. And I, as Michael said, it's, it's borne out in the economic data. The, the way the U.S. economy has been acting this year, you think the Fed had raised rates three times March, June, and uh, and September. The way that the uh, the economic numbers have been going, so this this signaling effect appears to have had a big impact on the Main Street economy uh, as it is. So in, in some ways, you might say the Fed might be better off just doing the, the one cut and telling everybody we're done than, uh, than leaving the uncertainty keep overhanging the, uh, the market. It's, it's, it's a funny one. There's a lot of uh, – Michael and I have had great debates on this all year, and, and the reason is because there's, there's so much conflicting data out there and, uh, and speakers and everything else that you, you – that everybody can take uh, analysis and do really strong analysis and come up with widely varying results, and it's 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 beyond just the uh, that's what makes the market to uh, there, there's just a lot of uh, conflicting uh, conflicting data and information out there, and because of that, one of the things we are likely to see when the Fed news comes out is probably and we've seen it in in, in past uh, past uh, announcements as well is we'll probably get a fairly sizable move in both directions. Whatever, whatever it goes first, we'll probably see a reversal, and then we'll see a reversal again. And, and I suspect it'll, we'll probably get quite a bit of choppiness and volatility off of the announcements. So, and because I found it when I'm writing up the insights, that uh, that often when I start writing the insights at one minute after the news comes out, by ten minutes after the news comes out, things have completely changed, and I've got to go back and revise it. So, so be be where. Uh, be note that when we when the news does come out, we're likely to see some fairly strong moves in both directions as people try to sort out what it actually means. So basically, with respect to the dollar, this is the dollar index over the past two years, and as you can see from October 2014 to round about where we are now, you can see how high the dollar has come from in terms of its trade weighted index. So it's still around about 12% up on the year already, um, even though it's well down from the peaks that we saw in March. But look at that line that I've drawn through the peaks in the dollar index for March. We're, rub we're rubbing right up against them. So certainly in the context of where we've been since March, we've been trending sideways, but with progressively lower peaks. And uh, that's, you know, that's no better illustrated with respect to the euro dollar chart that I've got here, which I've drawn through the lows there. We've got euro dollar. Now, we've, we saw the strong down move from Draghi's comments on Thursday and then the Bank of Japan, sorry, Bank, People's Bank of China on Friday. Since then, we've seen a little bit of a sideways consolidation. Big question is now, is this a flag? for a move lower towards 108.20, which is really my line in the sand for the euro to not go any lower. At the moment, we've found a good deal of support through there. 
the May lows, the July lows. You know, could this be a little bit of a flag before another move lower towards these lows here and a rebound? You know, it's 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 pretty difficult to say because you've got two central banks pulling and pushing against each other at the moment. And really, while Draghi has said that the ECB is prepared to consider more QE, considering more QE and actually doing it are two totally different things. So we're going to you're going to have to make do with an awful lot more what I would call central bank speak between now and December with respect to where euro dollar is going to go. But certainly in the context of this particular move, I don't expect euro dollar to go much below these lows that we've seen over the past two to three months. I think we're range bound and I think as long as the dollar index remains above that key resistance level, um, that will continue to be the case. It's a slightly different story with respect to cable. This here again, we are similar sort of trend line. April lows, 145.65, drawing through the lows there, brings us in around about 152. So again, if we get a particularly um, hawkish Fed um, or a hawkish interpretation initially, then this 152 level should act as support for a rebound. But on the flip side of that, we have got resistance coming in. That helps if I actually draw it through the right peak. Um, we have got resistance coming in from the August highs coming in through there at around about 154.50. So again, the momentum is pointing to the downside. Maybe we could drift lower a little bit, but overall, I still expect these May lows around about 150.90 to continue to hold any downside in pound and in, in, the, in the sterling unless something fundamental changes in the outlook for the cable, particularly against the dollar. We're just going to talk about dollar yen because I think that more than anything is probably at a greater risk of a breakout simply because of the compression that we're seeing not only in the Ichimoku charts but also in the Bollinger Band charts. And I'm going to draw that one on separately and I'll let Colin talk about that while I construct the fresh chart for that particular um, chart. Certainly. So what we've seen here, and as I've talked about the uh, the U.S. dollar uh, uh, peaking, we're seeing that, that relative to the yen here, we have a uh, we had with the U.S. dollar index, it kind of had a double top back in March and April against the yen. It had the double top in June and August, and it has started to work its way uh, back downward anyways. And it's been going sideways basically for the last six weeks. Uh, there's been a lot of confusion, or not confusion, but uncertainty and indecisiveness around dollar yen because people are wondering, well, what is the uh, is the Bank of Japan going to do? The ECB has come out and said, okay, well, we're thinking about ramping up QE, and, and people have been speculating, well, what will the Bank of Japan do with their QQE program? Will they ramp it up, or will they uh, they keep it the same? So the last two meetings they've held, but this October meeting, which is uh, – uh, Thursday night here and Friday morning in Japan is is the is the big one that people have been focusing on the the October will they will they ramp it up or won't they and Japanese data has been soft if you listen to Kuroda he hasn't sounded overly enthusiastic about raising uh, QE I think that the the Bank of Japan's their data is soft, but at the same time, I think they'd rather have the government step up more than them step up more, but we'll see. If the government's not going to step up more, then maybe they need to step up more, and what are they going to do related to the fact that the uh, that a number of the other uh, central banks are still firmly in easing mode, particularly the PBOC for them? And uh, and, and so, I mean, th th that one really is a coin toss for me. I think it could go either way. And, but when it does, and Michael will tell you why, the yen, dollar yen will probably explode in one direction or the other. This is the thing with dollar yen. I think at the moment you've got you've got a potentially hawkish Fed and a potentially dovish um, Bank of Japan, and I think the expectation is that we could potentially go higher. I, on the other hand, I'm not of that opinion. I think I think the dollar at the moment is heavily overbought. I think there's still a expectation that the Fed will raise rates sometime within the next three to six months. I think that expectation is wildly overstated because I'm struggling to see where they're going to get the consensus for for a rate rise. And I'm going to draw you to some comments I made in my morning note this morning. And I think this really comes into the context of the statement. The statement was in the last statement in September, there was a line that said the risks to the outlook for economic activity and the labor market are nearly balanced. Now that is clearly not the case now on the back of two week payrolls report. So the key question for me is will they soften that language in a way that reflects the concerns of the Fed governor and permanent voting member, Lael Brainerd, 
who is a permanent voting member, she doesn't rotate on or rotate off, and whose views are shared by another permanent voting member, Daniel Tarullo, who made similar comments that economic risks are tilted to the downside. If there's any reference to risks being tilted to the downside, I think it's very unlikely that the Fed will move in December. Or Furthermore, January. Or January for that matter. And that brings me into further downside pressure to inflation, because this week we have US GDP numbers, but we also have the employment cost index on Friday. Keep an eye on that, because that's a reflection of salary and wage increases. The expectations are that that's going to increase um, by 0.6% from 0.2%. I would be surprised if we get an increase of that magnitude, but furthermore, I think inflationary pressures within the, within the US are probably a little, are still still very much lagging, and that's pretty much borne out in this gasoline chart. Because if you look at what crude oil prices and gasoline prices have done over the past 12 months, we can see that throughout 2014 we saw crude prices, WTI, this is the purple line, move pretty much in lockstep with gasoline prices. Now you would have thought that, given the fact that you need to drive pretty much anywhere in the US to actually do anything, that there would have been a significant fiscal boost to spending patterns from amongst US consumers. We haven't seen that, and in 2015, we got a strong rebound in crude prices, but the gasoline prices actually pushed well away pushed much, much higher, much more quickly. And I think that actually acted as a little bit of a break on the US economy, not only in Q1, but also in Q2. But note now that that divergence that we've seen between gasoline prices and crude prices has now closed up again. And the fact is, we've seen a significant drop in gasoline prices, and yet we've still seen, well, we've still not seen any sign whatsoever that US consumers feel constrained to loosen their purchase strings. That tells me that there's still some disinflation in the pipeline because these sorts of things will lag over the course of the next two or three months, maybe even the next three to six months. And as such, I think it means that the Fed's language tonight in the statement will be just as important as market expectations. Yes, and, and so not just with related to the economy and employment, but also with regards to inflation and, and also other markets, because one of the reasons why the Fed held off back in September was because we were just coming out of that huge bout of volatility we had seen in China, where the markets had, had exploded up in the spring and then crashed in the summer, and uh, and the Fed looked like we're trying to put some distance between that and their uh, their decision and make sure that the dust settled, which it did, as we've seen on the charts. But, uh, but at the same time, we still want to see well, what are they going to say about you know, the, the PBOC has been cutting, the ECB might cut, uh, the, the Riks Bank raised their QE and, and, and so on. That uh, It'll be interesting to see what they have to say about that as well. And uh, I see you've brought up the Kiwi dollar chart, so maybe we can talk to them as I can talk to them as well if you'd like. You can, yeah, carry on, mate, because obviously the Kiwis report tonight as well, and the FOMC and the RBNZ. Maybe there's some lessons for the Fed in what the RBNZ did in 2014. I'll let you tell them about that. Uh, absolutely. So in 2014, the uh, RBNZ had reloaded their uh, and, and actually had raised rates. They raised rates four times for a total of one percent. They went from two and a half to three and a half percent. And this was similar to what other central banks had done previously. The Bank of Canada back in 2010 had gone from half a percent to one percent. That reloaded them so that when the uh, oil market crashed, they were able to give those two hikes back. And that's what the RBNZ has been doing this year as well. They've been giving these hikes back. So that big decline we've seen in the, in the Kiwi dollar this year was was them cutting rates and talking the dollar down. Now, uh, interestingly enough, they've, so they've now given back three of the four cuts. My feeling had been that they would give back all four. Uh, amazingly enough, the, uh, the street consensus is that they're going to hold this time. Uh, New Zealand data has basically stabilized, but I'm not convinced that their economy has stabilized. I wouldn't be surprised if they actually did cut one more time. And uh, on top of that, the other thing to watch for is in their statement is if they start taking 
shorted the dollar again because it has come up over the last few weeks. As, as expectations of the fourth rate cut have gone away, the Kiwi dollar has been on the rebound. And, uh, and uh, in the past, they, not only have they tried to talk the dollar down, but they're one central bank that actually does intervene in Forex markets if it gets too far ahead on them. They've done that a couple of times in recent years. So uh, watch for their, uh, their statement as well because they could start taking pot shots uh, at their dollar. I wouldn't be, I would, I would have a, uh, have a hard time seeing how the dollar is uh, they're gonna, it's already leveled off and we're seeing lower peaks on the stochastics. I mean, I'd have a hard time seeing how they're going to let it, let a full blown hawkish, uh, hawkish read come through when their economy is still struggling and, uh, and let the Kiwi dollar appreciate much further from here, whether they do it with a rate cut, whether they do it through signaling in their statement or whether they just outright try and talk down the dollar. But I do suspect we could see it, it, them trying to knock it back down in, uh, in some way, shape, or, uh, or form. So because of that, we, uh, we do, of course, get a lot of action in the Kiwi dollar off of their, uh, their announcements, so don't be surprised if, uh, if we get that again. So that is at 4 o'clock p.m. No Eastern crisis. time. That is 8 o'clock p.m. In, uh, in London and 9 a.m. in Auckland. So it's two hours after the Fed decision, we get the RBNZ. And especially with milk prices being as um, weak as they are, the mm -hmm. last thing they want is a strong currency. Exactly. Absolutely. Okay, so that's the RBNZ. Look at where the key support level is. It's around about 66.95, 66.95 figure. So 66.95, 67. So that could be a key support level on any move on the RBNZ, or, or alternatively on, on, on what the Fed might do. So you may have a dovish Fed, which pushes the Kiwi back up to 68, and then suddenly the RBNZ comes in, cuts rates, and it comes all the way back down again. So that's if the Fed goes those. dovish, they'd be they'd be uh, hard pre they'd be under pressure to do same yeah to go dovish mm. okay right. so that's, that's 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 the rbnz and um i think Rick's um bank. the rick's bank yes let's talk about yeah, the rick's bank in the Rick's bank. There's a, there's a definite theme here colin isn't there easing monetary policy does the fed really want to be the outlier here well, that's an interesting thing because the question I've been asking myself is that we've been having uh, – central banks have been in easing mode all year, and, and that's why I think the Fed signal at this one will be interesting because I've been wondering, are we – is this continuing or are we getting to the point of, of maximum stimulus and are we getting to the point where we're perhaps getting towards the end of this, this uh, easing cycle? And it'll be interesting to see what happens with the Fed because the next Fed meeting is, is a couple of weeks after the ECB meeting, the Bank of Canada meeting, the uh, Bank of England and a few others meet just before that, and I'm wondering if, if we do get a hawkish hold from the Fed, that that could be like a, a last call. You know, if you're going to ease, do it now before we start going back the other way. We'll see what happens. Or does the Fed stay on the same trend as everybody else and, and just kind of stay off in, in devish territory? So this is why the, uh, the statement's particularly significant. So let me go back and talk about uh, Sweden for a minute. So mm. Sweden is running negative interest rates, and there had been a lot of talk over the last while that, well, maybe they'll, they'll code they'll go deeper because they're at negative 0.35, Swiss are and, uh, and Danes are at negative 0.75. So, and, uh, and they did say that they, they do have more room to go down, but they did not cut interest rates today. Instead, they, they raised QE. And, uh, and you'd think with the central bank raising QE that, w that their currency would go down. Instead, this, uh, the Swedish krona goes up, and, and quite substantially, it's actually the top performing currency uh, among the majors today. So. What's going on? Well, it seems to me as though probably the street had expected them to go even more dovish and cut interest rates again. Uh, the other thing that was interesting was that they actually were, were one central bank that actually said they're starting to see signs of, uh, of inflation starting to pick up again, which seems a little early relative to, to what we're seeing in commodity markets. But nonetheless, uh, it seems as though perhaps they weren't quite as dovish as people had been hoping, or that if, if inflation does start bouncing back, that, that perhaps maybe they won't be quite as, uh, as stimulative in the future, and we're, we're seeing the uh, Swedish krona go back the other way. I just find it really intriguing when markets don't react the way they, they, that you think they're going to. Always twigs my attention and has me start doing more digging and asking why. And certainly the Canadian dollar is also experiencing a little bit of a rebound today, probably on the back of that uh, rally in oil prices. But it's I would interesting think so. That, but it's interesting the Kiwi and the Aussie have, sh have slumped quite sharply, which does seem rather counterintuitive, um, which leads me to finish with the Canadian dollar because I'm sure you want to talk about that because we haven't actually talked about that today, have we? 
Uh, no, we haven't, and it, it's been quite an interesting week for the uh, Canadian dollar after our, the, uh, the election results from last week that uh, ended with a majority government. That was very well received by the street that uh, for, uh, for two reasons. First of all, having a majority means that they have the mandate, the Liberals have the mandate to proceed with what policies they have, and we avoid the, the risk, like we were running a risk of a, of a three-way hung parliament and a minority government, and, and it was going to be a mess. And so that, that all got cleared out, and most importantly for the street, also the, uh, the NDP, who are the Canadian equivalent of the Labour Party, got absolutely trounced. They lost half their seats, and they had been talking about ripping up the uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. So. Uh, and, and of course, we know markets don't respond well to people that like to rip up trade deals. So them uh, them getting uh, knocked back into uh, obscurity was a good was uh, also seen as a positive by the market. So that helped the loonie to come down. Uh, our U.S. dollar had to come down. It basically had been backing up since that was on the weakness we'd seen in crude oil prices over the last week. But now that crude oil is starting to bounce back, the loonie is as well. Okay, so keep an eye on that daily candle. Um, to, depending on where that closes this evening, could determine the future direction of the Canadian dollar. At the moment, we've got a bearish engulfing day, but the day is not yet over. So, you know, I always wait for confirmation from candlestick patterns like that, and you should do the same. So really, I think we're probably going to wrap this up now, ladies and gentlemen. Just to conclude um, this FOMC preview, the key things I think that we need to watch out for, obviously, look at the statement. Look for any sort of change in the language. Look at any references to the labour market, because in its last statement, the, the Fed did refer to an improving labour market with solid job gains. You can't really say that's the case now, because since then we've had a poor September number, as well as a downward revision to the August number. More importantly, will the committee keep the line that risks to the outlook for economic activity and the labour market are nearly balanced, or will they soften the language? and are they still concerned about international developments. So that for me, I think, are really the key factors that we need to focus on. Will the Fed keep the option of a December rate rise on the table or will they push it out into the um, 2016 and basically, I think, reinforce the point of data dependency? Uh, yes, and, and of course, on top of that, will also be the uh, the reaction as uh, to this, and, and how will the market, how would the markets react to a dovish Fed? The markets reacted negatively to a dovish Fed in September. They reacted positively to a dovish ECB last week. How are the how will the markets going to react to uh, to anything? I mean, the U.S. dollar has been acting as you would expect. Any dovish news, the dollar goes down. Hawkish news, the dollar goes up. But this, uh, we're at a tipping point for stocks where where we've seen sometimes they take it positively, sometimes they take it negatively, and we could see both happen within 10, 15 minutes of the announcement. So uh, we're likely also to see some fairly significant swings before things settle out. Which means tread lightly. Indeed. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this month. Um, Colin and I would like to thank you for your attendance. Is there any, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask them. Um, otherwise, we will we will finish up this um, this webinar, and we will then post it on YouTube for you guys to listen back to um, at your own convenience. Okay, so no questions. All right. Well, thanks for your time, ladies and gentlemen, and um, we'll probably do another one of these just prior to the December meeting. Um, similar sort of format, look at expectations and what have you. So hopefully you'll join us both then. Yes, and also we're going to have our uh, regular monthly non-firm payrolls webinar will be next Friday at uh, 3, uh, 1, 1, 15. 1 15 p.m. Uh, 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 London UK time. Yeah, so yeah, Which please will go back to uh, 8.15 p.m. a.m. here mm. in, uh, in North America. So please feel free to join us for that one. So that's 1.15 next Friday um, for non-farm payrolls because maybe that could give us further indications as to what the Fed might do as well. All right. Thanks very much, guys. And um, Thanks, everyone. Know, have a good day trading.